Good morning, everyone. This is Crime Talk, and my name is Scott Reich. Well, it's the weekend, and that means it's the weekend update. So we have put all the top stories throughout the week conveniently located in one video for you. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. Next on the docket, let's talk about the Idaho college student deaths. All right, police investigators on the deaths of four University of Idaho students who died in the uh, knife attack earlier this month have insisted at least one of the victims was targeted, but they refused to say which one of the friends could have been the focus of the attack. So the Idaho State Police spokesman, Aaron Snell, said it is possible all four victims could have been intended targets of the November 13th stabbings. He confirmed that investigators have gathered evidence that suggests the killings were targeted, but admitted they are no closer to identifying the murderer. He said, quote, we still believe it was a targeted attack based upon the evidence at the scene and how everything developed. That's what we know. We believe that's accurate, he stated. Now, he refused to say which of the victims the police believe to be the target, um, describing that as a, quote, delicate situation, end quote. He said specifically that part of the ongoing investigation, that's a real delicate question. And when we're able to say that, or if we're able to say that, we'll definitely do that. It's very similar to the whole stocking, right? Potentially, if there was a stalker, that would be somebody of extreme interest. You can't lay out all of your cards at once, he said. We're trying to find the various potential participants. Law enforcement investigators did say uh, regarding the uh, four murders of the uh, University of Idaho students, that they do not believe the killings are related to unsolved stabbings in Washington State and Oregon. For those of you who do not know, on November 13th, authorities received a 911 call at an off-campus apartment in Moscow, Idaho, where officers found four students savagely stabbed to death. Madison Mogan, Kaylee Goncalves, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal. Now, thus far, police have not identified a suspect, as we noted, or located a murder weapon, prompting some to speculate whether the perpetrator had killed before. Speculation. The Moscow Police Department on Friday said it had received numerous inquiries about a 1999 double stabbing in Pullman, Washington, and a 2021 double stabbing in Salem, Oregon. They said while these cases share similarities with the King Street homicides, there does not appear to be any evidence to support the cases are related. The Oregon case, the unknown assailant attacked Travis and Jamelin Juton while they were sleeping around 3 a.m. on August 13th of 2021. Travis attempted to defend himself and fought back, but he ultimately died from his injuries. His wife, Jamelin, uh, then only 24, was stabbed 19 times and actually survived. Now, details about the 1999 stabbing in Pullman, Washington, um, are not generally available, but the police say, don't worry about it. We've got this, not related. Also, police said they have received at least 260 digital media submissions from community members and that investigators have collected 113 pieces of physical evidence, which are now being analyzed by the Idaho State Police Crime Lab. Now, the governor there has allocated up to $1 million in state emergency funds to help pay for the investigation. And apparently police work through the holiday weekend and are putting in overtime to investigate this case. What investigators have been able to confirm is that they believe that the victims were stabbed to death between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. on the second and third floors of the residence, and the assailant did not attack two roommates that were on the first floor. Police say they do not believe the surviving roommates had anything to do with the murders. Police have also cleared other individuals who interacted with the victims in the hours before they died. Most students are out of the city for the Thanksgiving break, and they will be allowed to finish their semester remotely if they do so desire. Now, the Moscow police have denied reports that the victims were bound and gagged uh, when they were stabbed to death on November 13th, and an autopsy found no signs of any bondage. Now, Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen lived in the house with the three female victims, but miraculously survived the attack, only to find their friends deceased the next morning. Both girls had been out of town separately on Saturday night and returned home about 1 a.m. before the other four victims came home from the night out. 
Now, police received a call at noon on November 13th and concluded that the four had been stabbed to death up to nine hours before the killing occurred between 3 and 4 a.m. There were also no signs of forced entry. Police say there's no reason to believe the deaths of the four college students are related to the recent animal deaths in the area or to a dog found skinned from head to uh, tail on October 21st. Investigators have ruled out that the quadruple murder is not tied to other knife stabbings in Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, despite announcing last week that they were probing a possible link between the student's death and a similar case in Oregon, where we talked about the uh, man was stabbed by a crazed lunatic, apparently. Authorities have also ruled out a man who was seen speaking to Kaylee and Maddie at a food truck, which is where they were caught on surveillance footage uh, for the last time alive. Officials say they may believe that multiple perpetrators are responsible for the crime. So as you can see, uh, this case is rapidly moving to cold case status. The police, they have nothing. There's going to be some sort of physical evidence that is going to have to come in to this case um, or be discovered. I think that's actually going to help to solve it. Short of somebody confessing to it, which you never know. It could happen, but it's going to have to be some sort of uh, DNA physical evidence. Maybe the uh, perpetrator was injured in the attack, but it would seem like somebody knew what they were doing, probably came down the uh, hill uh, by the house. It was unlocked. They seemed to have known where they were going, what, where to go, who they were looking for. So it just seems uh, very odd to me, but the police thus far really have nothing. And if they do, they're keeping it very close to their chest. Like many Americans, we got a dog during the pandemic. My quarantine dog, Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Now, Miss Winnie has grown accustomed to being around us all the time. When we were leaving the house, Winnie would have extreme anxiety, so we decided to look for natural products to help with her anxiety. We looked for the highest quality CBD treats, and we were not satisfied, and neither was Winnie. So we created a high quality CBD product that absorbs faster and provides the required results faster. Baked in Colorado CBD treats and beverage enhancers are made with nanotechnology. The nanotechnology makes the CBD extraction more pure, also allows for Baked in Colorado products to work faster. Baked in Colorado products can help reduce your pet's anxiety, ease joint pain, and help with your dog's skin problems. Go to our online store and see what Baked in Colorado product is best for your dog. When you order at bakedincolorado.com, enter code WINNIE and receive 15% off your first order. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If your dog does not experience the desired results in 30 days, return the product and we will refund your money. No questions asked. The Idaho Student Investigation. What you need to know. All right, the stabbing murders of four friends from the University of Idaho while they slept has obviously sent shockwaves throughout not only that small college town in Idaho, but the rest of the country. Now, after partying at separate locations, all of the under 22 victims were killed at their off-campus home in the dead of night in a motiveless slaying. Now, local police and the FBI have examined thousands of pieces of evidence and hundreds of tips, but two weeks after the deaths, haven't announced a suspect or located the murder weapon. And with a killer on the loose, many students have declined to return to the university for the final week of the semester. And the father of one of the victims says that he's, well, a little frustrated by the police's response in this particular case. So what do we know so far? that we can actually say that we know, not on speculation, all right? So Kaylee Goncalves, she graduated from Lake City High School in Coeur Idaho in 2019 and attended the University of Idaho. She has been to high school with another victim, Madison Mogan, who was her best friend. Now, Goncalves shared a photo uh, with her roommate hours before her murder, writing, one lucky girl to be surrounded by these people. Now, Goncalves was uh, studying in the uh, College of Letters of Arts and Sciences and uh, was majoring in general studies. Then we have Madison Mogan. She was 21. She apparently worked multiple jobs, did extremely well in school, and somehow always was able to find time to prioritize her friends and family. Now, Mogan had been dating Jake Schreiger, whose world has been turned upside down by her death. 
And uh, Milgren was majoring in marketing and was a member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority. Then we have Zena Kernodal. She was 20 years old. Now, according to the university, Kernodal was a junior studying marketing and a member of the sorority Pi Beta Phi. Now, Zena had also been dating Ethan Chapman, who was also murdered at the same time she was. Now, Ethan Chapman was 20. Now, he was a freshman majoring in recreational sports and tourism management and was one of a set of triplets, all of whom attended the University of Idaho. He was a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity, and before the murders, the friends spent their Saturday night partying like many college students do. Now, Chapin and Kernodal went to a gathering at his fraternity and were home around 1.45 a.m. Gankalves and Mogan went to a local bar called the Corner Club. They left there about 1.30 a.m. They stopped at a late night food truck where they chatted with others online while waiting for their food. At approximately 1.30 a.m., the pair were caught on camera purchasing a portion of the carbonara pasta from Grub Wandering Kitchen, a food truck that offers late night eats on the weekend. Weekends. Parked up close to the Moscow branch of the State Farm Insurance Company and outdoor store Hyper Spud Sports, Madison and Kaylee were last glimpsed walking away towards what police have called a private party driver for their final ride home. Now, the rideshare driver, who has been eliminated as a suspect, drove the two students home and they arrived just before 2 a.m. Now, the route that they drove takes them less than five minutes to complete and cuts through the University of Idaho campus and actually passes the Sigma Chi house on the right where Zena and Ethan spent their last night before taking a left up King Road towards their home. The drive also goes past the Moscow Police Department headquarters, which can be seen on the left just as the route turns right onto the campus. Now, according to the police, the pair arrived home at about 1.45 at the same time Ethan and Zena and 45 minutes after their other roommates, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, sur who survived the attack. Now, less than two hours later, Madison, Kaylee, Zena, and Ethan were dead. Now, the autopsy results showed that all four died from stab wounds to the chest, with police saying that the murder weapon was largely a large military-style knife, which has not been found. What we do know is that once home, Gonkalve called her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Jack Ducour, seven times between 2.26 and 2.52 a.m., but he didn't answer because he was asleep. Now, police have ruled out Ducour as a suspect. Now, the four murdered students were found on the second and third floor of their home, but the two roommates living on the ground floor, Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen, were spared. It's unclear why the two roommates were not harmed and if they slept through the attacks. Funk and Mortensen had been out that night and arrived home just after 1 a.m., the morning of the murder. Now, the first Dylan and Bethany knew of their roommate's fate came after about 11 a.m. when they woke up and went upstairs to find them dead. Neither had spoken publicly about the murders, but have showed off matching tattoos to commemorate their fallen friends. It has also emerged that murdered roommates Kaylee's dog, Murphy, was at the house when the police responded about midday. However, authorities have not confirmed if they believe the dog was in the house at the time of the homicides. And police have yet to locate a murder weapon, as we noted, but they are believed to be seeking a fixed blade knife, possibly a K-bar styled combat knife. We can show you a picture of one of those. Now, the Moscow building supply general manager, a guy by the name of Scott Judas has said that police officers stopped by the retailer a few times in the week following the murders to ask if they had sold any knives of that type. They didn't sell that particular K-Bar style knife. Now, police have noted that they have processed more than 1,000 tips, collected 103 pieces of evidence, conducted almost 100 interviews, and taken more than 4,000 photographs of the crime scene. Now, police maintain that the murders were a targeted attack, but admitted they are still no closer to identifying the murderer today than they were the morning of the murders. Uh, police, like I said, have admitted there's no suspects and they have not recovered a weapon. Police say that they are not releasing a profile that they're developing of the suspect because it could lead to more fear 
and suspicion in the college town, which is already on edge following the homicides, with some students not returning to uh, finish classes in person. It's been suggested that the killer likely entered the 2300 square foot home between 3 and 6 a.m. through a sliding door and made their way through three bedrooms carrying out their knife killings something that's very up close and personal when it comes with a knife. Now, Goncalves and Mogan were killed on the third floor, while Chapin and Kernodal were killed in a bed they shared on the second floor. None of the victims showed any signs of any sort of sexual assault, and that's according to the police reports. And as we've noted, no motive yet is identified for why the murders took place. So the police don't know who's responsible for the killings, but they have ruled out a slew of suspects, including Goncalves' ex-boyfriend, uh, Mr. Decour, the man seen with Goncalves and Mogan at the food truck, the person who drove the two girls home, the surviving two roommates, Mortensen and Funk, and the victims themselves, as there is no evidence of a murder-suicide, and the friends summoned to the house by the surviving roommates on the morning of November 13th. Now, rumors have circulated that Goncalves had said that she had a stalker, but police have been unable to substantiate that claim. And police have taken a little bit of heat for their lack of development of leads in this particular case. They've also waffled on their communication to the public, first saying they didn't believe there's an ongoing community risk, even though they kind of walked that statement back a little bit because obviously the community is at risk because somebody committed four homicides and they haven't been apprehended. I would say that's a risk. Police also said that they don't know if the murderer fled and or is hiding in plain sight there in Moscow, Idaho. Now, police say that they have now mostly finished investigating the crime scene and that they have plans to release the scene uh, back to the owner of the property, but noted that it won't be released until the police are positive that there is nothing left to retrieve from the crime scene. That's right. They have to collect things of evidentiary value, and sometimes collecting nothing is something of evidentiary value. I know. Yes, particularly for the defense in this particular case. Now most of the police work is being done um, behind the scenes, specifically the uh, crime lab testing that's taking place. Now, police ha have done 150 interviews, they've stated, and the information that is being received is building what they believe to be the whole picture. Obviously, since they don't have a suspect at this time and they don't have a weapon or an eyewitness, it's a little difficult to figure out exactly what happened. So, since the police don't have that witness, they have to try and build what they believe is the picture of what occurred on the night. They have to look at the relationships of the four victims. Was there anything suspicious in any of those relationships? Are there any tidbits of information that they can draw from that and try to develop something of evidentiary value that could provide a suspect or some motive as to the killings? They're going to have to look and see if was there anything that occurred that particular evening or was it something that had been brewing for a while. And obviously, the um, they have to look at all the movements of the residents themselves. So that means basically everyone is a suspect until they are not a suspect. Now, remember, many of the students were allowed to finish their classes and not return. So if the alleged perpetrator was a student, what a great way to stay away. If the perpetrator lives in the area, literally hiding in plain sight, unless there is some physical evidence or some sort of statement or admission made to somebody, I would think that that suspect, that potential suspect, the perpetrator, is probably feeling pretty comfortable right about now. We'll keep you updated on any new developments. All right, next on the docket, the Delphi probable cause affidavit has been released. One word to describe it, weak. Now, I urge you to go watch our live show last night. We'll put a little link here. It was an hour. We read through it line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and outlined some of the issues with the case. It's weak. It may be enough to get somebody arrested, but that if that's all they got, that is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen. So please, Mr. Prosecutor in the Delphi case, please 
tell me you have some more evidence. All right, we'll give you the quick summary now. But more than five years after the slaying of the two Indiana teens in the small town of Delphi, details were released Tuesday in the case against the man accused in their killing. Now, while the documents shed some light onto uh, what happened that day, a lot of questions remain. Now, for those who aren't familiar, Abigail Williams, she was 13 and Libby German, 14 at the time, never returned to a prearranged pickup spot after their walk on the Delphi Historic Trails on the afternoon of February 13th of 2017. Searchers found their bodies the next morning, Valentine's Day, in a wooded area not far from the Monin High Bridge, which they had visited the day before. Now, in October, police announced that Richard Allen, of Delphi was arrested and charged with two counts of murder in the deaths of Libby and Abby. A redacted version of the probable cause affidavit was released. And when I mean redacted, the only thing that this judge, who I think is very good so far, only thing she redacted was the names of the witnesses. Everything else comes in, is released to the public. Kudos to the judge. And you have to remember, it was the defense that wanted this released. And the prosecutor said, no, don't release it because they said that there could be one other person or others that acted with Mr. Allen, allegedly. Well, they sure didn't put that in their affidavit. So here is a brief summary of what you may want to know. So an unspent bullet found within two feet of one of the girl's bodies had been allegedly cycled through the firearm owned by Mr. Allen, according to investigators, and the firearm was located by investigators at Mr. Allen's home on October 13th during the search. Now, when we went through this last night, the, the caveat, the warning that comes with saying this firearm cycled through that bullet, which was a Sig Sauer P226, which is a mass-produced firearm Frankly, um, police officers love Sig Sauer's and they're mass produced. And so the warning from the lab is that um, it's, uh, this analysis is subject to interpretation and it's subjective, which means it's open to interpretation, okay? It's not 100% ironclad that that firearm was the same one that was cycling through this unspent Fire, the unspent uh, round that was found next to the girls. So Mr. Allen didn't never denied that uh, he purchased the firearm in 2001, and he actually went to the Indiana State Police uh, Department voluntarily on October 26. When he spoke with the investigators, he stated he never allowed anyone to borrow or use the gun. When asked about the unspent bullet, he didn't have any explanation of why the bullet would be found between the bodies. Um, he again admitted that he was on the trail, but denied knowing victim one or two and denied any involvement in the murders. Now, Williams and German were killed uh, is still a mystery uh, to the public. The affidavit does not give a cause of death or explain how the girls were killed. However, you can kind of read between the lines where it was probably a sharp object. The affidavit also confirms the two girls were killed on the north bank of the Deer Creek as reported since February 14th of 2017. Now, a video taken by Libby German on the day the girls were killed was published and distributed by investigators. It shows a man in a dark jacket and jeans walking behind them on the Monon High Bridge on the trails east of Delphi. As the man in the video approached the girls, one of the team said, gun, according to the affidavit. Now, police first released a grainy image of the suspect from a video a day after the girls were found in 2017. A week later, they released audio of the man's voice saying, down the hill. The longer version of the same smartphone video released in 2019 shows the gait of the man as he was walking on the bridge, as well as a longer version of audio where he can be heard saying, guys, down the hill. Now, witnesses, according to the affidavit, told police they passed by a man on the trail that day Abby and Libby were killed and remembered seeing a car parked parking lot nearby. According to the affidavit, one of the three witnesses described the car as a PT Cruiser, another one said an SUV, and a third described it as a smart car. So here's a picture of a smart car. Here's a picture of a PT Cruiser. Here's a picture of a uh, SUV. And uh, here's a picture of a 2016 Ford Focus that Mr. Allen had at that particular time. You tell me, close? Hmm. Investigators believe those descriptions are similar enough in nature to the 2016 Ford Focus. 
so close enough. And one of the witnesses describes passing a man along the trail who wore a blue collar jacket and jeans and was muddy and bloody. She further stated that it appears he had uh, been in a fight, according to the affidavit. Now, only one of the witnesses described muddy and bloody clothing, and one witness said the man was wearing blue jeans and a blue jacket. As they passed by the man on the trail, uh, of the group said one of the members of the group said hi. The man glared at them. Uh, one of the witnesses said, according to the uh, to the affidavit. Now, investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down the Carroll County Road 300 North, which is where he then got into his alleged vehicle and drove away. Like I said, we'll have to wait and see. I really do not know. I was really expecting all the stuff with Keegan Klein. You know, he gave that big affidavit where the police were convinced that he was involved in some way. And then there's nothing. Go ahead, watch the video from last night. And um, I will also, if you Patreon member, you can watch the video last night where we use a SIG Sauer firearm and we show how to cycle through um, and uh, we explain the uh, problems with uh, gun uh, science, so to speak. There's lots of problems with it. I'm sure the defense will have no problem finding an expert saying when you have a firearm this mass produced that there's no way to say this is an exact match in any way whatsoever other than it came from, like I said, a mass produced firearm oftentimes carried by police. Just saying. Sig Sauer has a general policy where they make give steep discounts or free firearms to uh, police officers. So it could have been a police officer for all we know. You just never know. But we don't like to make those things. I'm just, just saying. Why did it take so long for Richard Allen to be charged? Well, it appears that his information was essentially lost. That's right. The 2017 interview with uh, Mr. Allen was overlooked due to a clerical error. A civilian FBI employee mislabeled or misfiled the tip information in their system, which means it didn't show up in the correct location during a data search. Investigators actually interviewed him, like I said, back in 2017, when he told them that, hey, I was on the Monon High Bridge um, and the free bridge between 1.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. on the day of the alleged murders. The timing matched the window in which the girls were killed. Now that's according to the police. As the case stalled, police returned to the investigation's very beginning. That's when the police discovered the interview with Mr. Allen, prompting them to look much closer at him as a suspect. Now, the Indiana State Police obviously announced his arrest on Monday, October 31st, even though he had actually been arrested on the 29th. Now, his potential tie to the case remained under seal until November 29th when the judge released the redacted version of the probable cause. And you may want to check out our live video that we did Tuesday night where we went through it line by line. But the uh, court document said that the unspent round from a gun allegedly owned by Mr. Allen tied him to the murders of Abby Williams and Libby German. And investigators discovered the bullet just feet away from the girls' bodies. Now, Allen told the police he had never let anyone else use his Sig Sauer P226. And according to the affidavit, a laboratory analysis determined that the unspent round had been cycled through Allen's gun. And Mr. Allen was unable to explain uh, why the unspent round was cycled through his gun. Now, you'll definitely want to take a look at our video that we did Tuesday night on our live. And if you're a Patreon, you want to check that out because we explain the whole cycling process. And um, like I said, I think it's not going to be too difficult for the defense to come up with somebody and say, hey, you have a mass produced gun. There's no way that you could possibly say it came from this particular mm -hmm. firearm with Mr. Allen. Um, now, based upon that information and some eyewitness accounts, police believe that uh, Mr. Allen is the man seen on the video taken by Libby German. And police had obviously released a grainy photo of the man commonly known as Bridge Guy as far back as 2017. Now, for now, Mr. Allen remains in custody and a bail hearing is set for early February of 2023. So I understand in the age of computers, everybody wants to go digital, okay? 
I have some younger people that work in my office, and we have digital. But if we have a case that is going to go to trial, and we know it's going to go to trial from the beginning, you know what we do? We print everything out. It's so much easier to find. It can't be you know, put into a different file by mistake that you don't know where it is. You have everything bait stamped from one through whatever the number goes through, and you can always pull it out. You have an original paper copy. Sometimes we get things so complicated uh, with computers and trying to be so smart and savvy. Just go old school and use paper. I'm telling you. And when you go to trial, some judges want to say, oh, we want to do this and that. I'm telling you, technology doesn't always work, and you have to be prepared with backup, and that's paper to present your exhibits, your video, your statement, whatever you're going to introduce. You got to have the backup. Go paper. I'm telling you. I know it's old school. I'm old, but I'm telling you, paper is the way to do it. All right. The attorneys for Richard Allen, the man accused of murdering Abby Williams and Libby German back in Delphi, Indiana on uh, February 14th of 2017, have fired back against the evidence presented by investigators. That's right. I think they may have been watching Crime Talk. So attorneys Brad Rossi and Andrew Baldwin stated that they argued on behalf of unsealing the court documents because Rick, their client, has nothing to hide and that they hope that releasing the information would lead to tips that assist them in proving his innocence. Now, they said Rick is a 50-year-old man who has never been arrested nor accused of any crime in his entire life. Allen's lawyer said he is innocent and completely confused as to why he's been charged with these crimes. His attorneys continued said they chose to speak out after stating that both police and the prosecutors have been able to conduct multiple press conferences over the past five plus years, while Mr. Allen has only had a single post press conference in which to assert his innocence. Attorneys went on to question the evidence in the court documents and asked if a single magic bullet is proof of guilt. It is a bit premature to engage in any detailed discussions regarding the veracity of this evidence until more discovery is received, but it is safe to say that the discipline of toolmark identifications is anything but scientific. The entire discipline has been attacked in courtrooms across this country as unreliable and lacking any scientific validity, and that they anticipate they are going to vigorously challenge any claims by the prosecution as to the reliability of its conclusion concerning the magic bullet. Like I said, they must have been watching our live program that we did the other night in regards to ballistics. It, it's junk, ladies and gentlemen. It's junk science. It really is. Allen's attorneys further pointed out that uh, Allen's Ford Focus is not in any way similar to the distinctive look of the PT Cruiser or a smart car that witnesses described. Huh. They must have been watching the show on Wednesday, I believe, when we discussed the exact same thing. It seems that the um, state police are trying to uh, bend facts to fit their narrative. The attorneys went on to detail Mr. Allen's character by stating that in the five years since Allen provided police with information, he never got rid of his vehicle, his guns, or threw things out regarding his clothing, nor did he alter his appearance or relocate to another community. My goodness, I'm absolutely convinced they've been watching Crime Talk. These are all the things that we discussed the other day. He did what any innocent man would do and continued his normal routine, his attorneys argue. According to his lawyers, um, Mr. Allen shared information with the police and conservation officers voluntarily, and he didn't hear from police for another five years. The lawyers also point out that uh, police contacted Mr. Allen two weeks before a contested sheriff's election and within days of a lawsuit being filed where the Carroll County deputy claims he was demoted over suggestions offered for the Delphi murder investigation. Allen's lawyers also questioned the Carroll County prosecutor's previous allegations of others being involved in the slaying of the Delphi girls, stating that there was no mention in the probable cause affidavit about the second suspect involved in the killing. The defense is confused by such discrepancies in the investigation and will be in a better position to respond 
as more discovery is received. Allen's lawyers finally say that their intent moving forward is to scrutinize the discovery, give attention to the tips their team is receiving, and offer this information to the public as long as the gag order isn't put into place preventing them from doing so. Carroll County Sheriff Toby Lesenby issued the following statement in response to Mr. Allen's attorney's uh, press release, said, quote, I feel a court of law is the proper and impartial setting for this matter to be vetted and not within the domain of the speculation or assumption of a public or social media arena. Patience and time must be afforded to the system, granting all aspects of the case to be brought to life. Hmm. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, there's a book out there that the lawyers for Mr. Allen are probably going to want to take a look at. They're making a case in the book called Forest for the Trees, and it basically outlines why, that's right, there's an alternate suspect. And what evidence do they have? Well, they give a lot of information as to the location of Ron Logan's property, and they also give some photo comparison for the people to take a look at. Take a look at these photos. One on the left is the mystery man on the bridge. Is that Mr. Allen or is that Ron Logan? I don't know. We're going to check it out. Not convinced one way or the other just yet, but uh, I'm sure the uh, defense is going to be looking into this for Mr. Allen as well. And uh, we'll try to get the author of this particular book on uh, to talk about it. And um, we'll ask him, well, any tough questions to see what he has uh, since he's accusing uh, Mr. Logan of responsibility for these crimes. So let's um, hopefully have him on uh, in the coming week or so. Next, let's talk Idaho. A mystery six person lived at the home where four University of Idaho students were uh, killed on November 13th. Now, although police in the small college town of Moscow, Idaho, say that they were not home when the murder took place. Now, the development came as family and friends were gathering to honor and remember Kaylee Goncalves, Maddie Mogan, Zaina Kernodal, and Etha Chapin, who were obviously all stabbed to death at the off-campus house. Now, no suspects have been publicly identified, and the murder weapon has not been recovered. Now, the sixth person was on the lease of the home, so it's unclear if they actually live there. The Moscow Police Department didn't identify that particular individual. Now, earlier, police had said that only five people lived in the home, Goncalves, Mogan, and Carnotal, and uh, as well as uh, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, uh, who were not harmed in the attack and are not considered suspects in any way. The Moscow police said that the Idaho State Forensic Police Lab uh, scientists are working on the case and uh, the results of their test will be provided uh, hopefully soon. The police also said that they're sticking to the theory that the uh, home was a targeted attack, but they do not know if the house or the persons inside were the ultimate targets. Now, the Leita County Prosecution Office caused a little confusion earlier this week when their office released a statement which appeared to walk back the theory that the killings were targeted. Idaho police have been criticized for some uh, contradictions and a uh, poor communication effort uh, in uh, this particular matter. And uh, they've also been criticized as it relates to why there is no suspect at this particular time. Why is nobody being arrested? And so as time goes on, people are starting to grow more upset. And a lot of people are starting to comment, if the killer was apparently so sloppy at this particular crime scene, why haven't they found him yet? Why is it taking so long to make the arrest for the killer? Um, they could have potentially fled, uh, not only out of state, but abroad, uh, given the amount of time that has passed. And um, everybody knows, well, maybe not everybody, but it's, it's common that uh, investigations that if the police don't have a lead, a suspect, or some sort of arrest, usually within the first 48 hours, their chances of solving that case are nearly cut in half. Well, the neighbor of the four University of Idaho students um, has stated that he went to the police station and offered to submit DNA evidence after becoming a target of some online speculation. We talked about this the other day. Now, this guy, Jeremy Reagan, he has been on the news. It's kind of like they talked to him because his house is near the house where the four college students were slain. 
And suddenly he was being accused that he may have had something to do with it. And he's absolutely stated repeatedly that he's had nothing to do with it. So Thursday, he went to the police station to submit his DNA. He said he went in there. No one ever contacted him. He said it'd just be easier for them if, if he was proactive and said, let's get this over with sooner rather than later. Take a mouth swab. And uh, he, he did that, and they left. Uh, then he left the police station. Now, I said, Reagan, he's a law student, a third-year law student. So he's getting ready to graduate, and he's going to uh, you know, become a lawyer. Now, some people said, well, wasn't Ted Bundy also studying to be a lawyer? Okay, you got to have proof to back that up. Otherwise, it's just slander. So, like I said, Mr. Reagan's been the subject of uh, a lot of speculation. And uh, he's appeared on at least three different interviews with separate news stations. Now, in an earlier interview with Fox News, Mr. Reagan said that he went to bed early that night. And then a couple hours later, we got a message that there was a bunch of police here. And uh, that was the end of the normalcy for the past week or so. Uh, Reagan was presented with the suspicions of Internet sleuths. Uh, saying that he may have had something to do with it. And he said, I had nothing to do with it. He said that at the time he's got nothing to hide. He's willing to give his DNA, fingerprints, whatever the police need. And he has done that. Uh, crush, questioned about speculation um, around him. Reagan said that uh, he thinks submitting his DNA will help with most of those rumors online. But he definitely says there'll be some that uh, just won't believe a single thing anybody says. Weird case. I hope the police find somebody. Seriously, but I think we, you know, at a certain point, this is going to go to a cold case status unless something is developed here rather quickly.